I think they have one front office person right now. And the problem I have with a lot of these teams, and I mean, I, I've been guilty of this too, is they spend all the money on the soccer and not on the business. And unfortunately, that doesn't sound good if I'm talking to players and coaches. But in reality, if you don't have the front office in place that can produce revenue, at, at some point, the owner is going to get tired of it or run that's, out of that's, money. I mean, that's why Syracuse left Syracuse is, is because, I mean, they had one – one office person. One, yeah, one or two person operation can't work. Yeah, and now and now all of a sudden in Utica, it's it's full blown. They've got sales staff. They've got everybody. Yep. And, and they know what they're doing. And and we did in, in St. Louis. In St. Louis, early we had a bigger staff. Our first year, we had the was our biggest staff, and then it kind of just dwindled down a little bit over the the next two seasons. But um, we had to. I, I mean, we did extremely extremely well on revenue in st louis our numbers were i mean we didn't comp the house there those were you know paid tickets i mean we were averaging over forty thousand a game in, in paid ticket revenue that's that's on the high high side of this league mm. um and there's some teams doing even better i know milwaukee's had some big games and you know we had some up in the 60 70 000 range um but even at an average of over 40 is you know, that's over 400,000 in ticket revenue. You know, some of these lower end teams are operating probably in the 400,000 range, 350. Um, so it definitely can be done, but you know, like Orlando was a big, you know, the prior owner here, I was always on him. I'm like, dude, you need staff. This is not a one person operation. This isn't Cedar Rapids. And um, you know, it, it's tough. People don't get it. Or they get it and just don't want to spend the money there. Well, yeah, yeah. Or, yeah they are always banking on. Oh no, all we need is the one thing, and then the people come to the games and <laughs> and and I think the you know league is kind of the the whole eleven sports thing. All we need is one half of one percent of the forty six million households this is in, and that's two hundred some thousand people that are going to watch our sport. And, okay, sure. <laughs> yes. And I know when I start my next team, I know I got a pool of people to go to. Nice, nice. So we're um, in the in the in the plans. Yeah. So what are you? So one of my questions is what what's your next venture, um, indoor soccer wise, or soccer wise, or sports wise, or I don't know. Corn I, dogs. I corn dogs for everybody. Maybe I'm gonna name my team the Corn Dogs. Oh, that's it. I'm getting a jersey. Sign yeah. me up. Sign me up. Seriously. That may be. That may be what I do. You know what? I looked at. I looked at trying to get an MASL team back now. I mean, I, I negotiate, I was negotiating with an arena in Atlanta, just couldn't get it to a point where it was financially reasonable, where I thought that it could, it could be a sustainable business. Cause if I do it, it's, it's, it's business. Like I need to at least break even I, I'm, I'm 41 now. I'm tired of losing money, like break even and I'll do it forever. Make money even better. But, um, Atlanta was a market that I have a lot of interest in and it just financially, I want to say the arena was like over 10,000 still. And that's just not, it's just not in the wheelhouse for this level right now. Um, Is that per game or? Yeah. Yeah. Per game. So give you an idea. St. Louis was probably the best arena deal in the league. We were paying $3,500 a game that included everything. Ticket takers, ushers, security, we had, we got $4 a car parking. We got a concession rebate. It's the one of the best deals, if not the best in the league. That's a um, Sherlock is the only one that probably has you beat on pure. Well, yeah, on. maybe something like that. <laughs> something like that. But you know, Lakeland, I think we paid 4,000, same deal. Basically I gave them our contract in St. Louis. I said, this is what we need. And they ended up, we, we came to about 4,000. Um, but you, you really got to, that arena deal has got to be structured somewhat good where you can also get decent dates mm -hmm. and you got to have the support of the arena. If you don't have the support of the arena, I mean, it's yeah. like pissing in the wind. And a lot of these arenas, they look at us and we're like the redheaded stepchild in St. Louis. Our first year, we had a hockey team there, ECHL team. And it was all about the hockey team for the arena. We were like the redheaded stepchild for real. And we outdrew the hockey team every single game. 
Mm -hmm. And so it took about half season, but like, you know, and then that hockey team was gone and then we became the main tenant. But in, in most of these arenas, the soccer teams are the afterthought. They don't want us there. Most of them, they'll well, say they do, but they don't. So when they the, when the, the news article came yeah, out, just like Syracuse. And when yeah. the news article came out like a year ago about St. Louis building or uh, uh, San Diego building their own new stadium, the article basically they interviewed one of the guys who owns the stadium there or the, the arena there and he said well we have 137 dates a year and 12 of those are san diego soccer's games we'll be okay without them and yeah. it's just kind of a brushed off like now nah, whatever you know get this we don't need that and so you got to find that you got to find that right facility like for me st louis was that right facility so before I did soccer there, I started the arena football team there. But to a, attract me, the arena bought me turf. Oh. They bought turf and the dasher board system that you need for football. So that saved me $100,000 right there. Sure. Uh, and then they gave me a hell of a deal. You know, again, 4000 a game it was that first year. And, um, you know, it's like when you have that, it's like, okay, they're invested you get in the me. top 50 fans in the league to find some money and just have it be a fan run team. Looking under my desk. It's funny. I that could, you see that. I could right. wear this and yell Charlotte corn dogs everywhere. Geo actually brought up the fact of like how, how much we could, could we do a fundraiser GoFundMe type thing and start an MSL three team? Yeah. Yeah, or even even uh, All Star Team. Now that like we got a rough idea of what like how much it is to rent a, a facility just for one, it could be like the All Star game <laughs> to buy in the box. Could we fund fan fan? Jeez, fan fund an All Star game. Fan fest. A fan fest. Fan. F no fan. Could, could the fans fund an All Star game? Is a, is the basic question. Yeah. Um, we so when I I, I don't want to say this I, I I'm not saying this at all bragging or anything because I, it's not the kind of person I am but when the thing happened with the Dallas players they got uh, they got their their vans broken into and all their equipment stolen like yeah, I remember or seeing or that or whatever um, Dennis doing a uh, St Louis fan and I he he said to me he's like can, can we do a GoFundMe for them and I'm like well I think that's gonna take too long they need money now because they lost like their passports and their car keys Damn. so. Even guys who could fly back to the airport had no way to get in their cars that are waiting for them. And they need just like, like cash right now. So I said, all right, family, step up, send me money through my personal PayPal and I will send it to someone on Dallas. I didn't even know who I could send it to at the time. And it turns out the, the front office wanted nothing to do with us because of legal reasons. They thought if we were, they were getting reimbursed, then it would be more of a like, well, you're double dipping kind of thing. And the, I'm like, no, I'm sending cash to help out. And uh, we got a hold of Freddie Mugin. We had 20, 20, 25 people raised up $650 in like two and a half days, sent nice. him down the cash. Everybody got taken care of and figured out. And cause I mean, even like the, the feed arena, a passport is 60 bucks. Yeah. You just lost your wallet with who yeah. knows what in it. That's going to take at least $60 to replenish. You know, it's not like the end of the world money, but if you're in the middle of nowhere with no underwear, I mean, <laughs> just the well, and some of these guys are living check to check too. And I mean, 20 bucks is a huge deal. So, I mean, whatever you were able to send was, was huge. And I, I know the guys were very appreciative of that. Yeah. They sent a cool little video and, and yeah. And I, you know, we're trying to get Freddie on the show, but he coaches too much. So he's doing good. He's doing good out there, but uh, I like Freddie. Yeah. yeah. He's, like a good, he's a good guy. I mean, definitely, you know, if if we could do that in two days, imagine what we could spend a year doing, you know. I'm telling you. Yeah. You I mean, I think I think the big challenge is just like – and, you know, as an owner, you don't really put a lot of stuff out there. Now that I'm an owner, I don't really care. Like, um, So, like, it's hard for fans to understand really the, the dollars and senses of – operating a franchise that's the, that's the challenge is like how do you how does the league get to where things are more consistent and you you ask why is cornhole on the espn and the masl isn't it it's because of that they don't look at like milwaukee they're going to look at the worst possible team in the league and that's what they're judging us on 
I mean, I had that happen with sponsors. They're, it's not looking at, at me or the top. They go right to the bottom and they want to know what the worst is. And they're like, why are their teams, you know, our first year playing in rec facilities? Yeah. And it, I don't care what anybody says. It cost me sponsorship. I mean, it did. Um, so, well, we have the Baltimore Blast to thank for that. Anyways. <laughs> Wait a second. Our facility is state-of-the-art, but our video was crap about half the season. It, it got – no, I, it, to give Baltimore <laughs> complete credit, and I talked to Gianni a lot about this, they completely replaced the system and the yeah. people doing it, yeah. and it improved 100 times over. That was one that I could see, especially with the new turf last season, I could see that going on a, on a, major, on a major TV station. Um, it's – you got to get that. Right. You got to get that, and then you got to get butts in seats. Yeah. So when you watch highlights and you see a great play, and there's a thousand people there, two thousand people. Yeah. I mean, it does not get them excited. And we could be on ESPN, but we're going to have to pay, and that's going to cost, you know, probably a hundred thousand dollars plus a game to get like, that. And ESPN and, wants a satellite truck at every game because they're going to want to do it themselves. I mean, even when we in. Uh, in the MISL days, I, I don't know if all of you guys were a, around then. Back in 2013, my first year, um, 2014, the next year, we did some ESPN3 games. Yep. And even that, we had to have special equipment shipped in and all this other stuff. And it's tough. I think <clears throat> if the league can focus on and, – and this is – I've suggested this to Josh and to the rest of the league is – almost every other league out there has somebody from the league office that is their job is to help the teams. Mm -hmm. Like I never had help. Nobody ever came out and did a city visit or came out and talked to our sales team or did sales calls. And our first year, the MISL was the, the only year that we had that uh, we did a weekly uh, ticket call, weekly sponsorship call, we would have a weekly report on everyone's uh, revenue and ticket stuff. All that kind of stuff is gone and they've tried to do a little stuff here and there, but they need somebody that can be on the, the phone with, you know, the Baltimore blast and talk about like, you know, their, their groups that are coming in, you know, an upcoming game and how they can come up with new ideas to attract new fans. And now, um, and what, what would you, what, how would, I guess, like, how would you guide teams to get out of survival mode and into, all right, now we're out of survival mode, let's, or how do we get out of survival mode and get into, like, hey, let's grow this? You know, obviously the front office staff, but what else? I think the, the thing that worries me right now is I don't see a ton of activity out there with most of the teams. And I get it, COVID and everything, but to be honest – the way the cycle works for selling in sports, it's not like, oh, okay, oh, we're playing next week. Let's go sell tickets. It takes, it's a process. It takes time. And so even when I was up in Virginia with the Nationals uh, minor league affiliate baseball team, during COVID, I had our sales team still selling. Now it's a different approach. It's a different, you know, everything, but if the person isn't able to close them, if, if they feel that they're not able to be closed, then it's all about just building that relationship. It's like, we're not going to push, push until you find out where we're at. If they're not ready, then let's set up a follow-up in 30, 60 days. Let's see how their family's doing, see how their business is doing. But you have to continue that process because if you just stop everything, which most teams did, and then yep. expect to pick it up as soon as, Josh says, hey, we're playing yeah. on this date. You're going to be screwed. And that's honestly more what I'm worried about than – like that's first. And then long term, it comes down to treating this like a business. And, again, some of these owners have a, a, a lot of money and it's a, it, maybe it's a toy or it's, it's their fun thing. But how would you treat your real business? Would you not have proper staff in place? Would you yep. just hire interns and say that that's your staff? No, you wouldn't. So why would you do it for this? Yep. And, you know, 
what I would really like to do and what I try to do now is, is help those teams, you know, like there's so many things you could be doing right now. Even if your, your sales team isn't selling now is the best time to be improving their skills, giving them training, giving them, you know, coaching. And, you know, that's really what we focused on in Virginia with the baseball team. The first month of COVID, it was nothing but let's build these guys up, guys and gals. Let's teach them. Let's get them to improve their skills. Let's bring on special guests. We did Zoom calls twice a day, every day. I would bring on different people. Um, from different teams, from different leagues, to just talk about what they're going through and what what works for them in normal times and in COVID. But I just feel like half the teams don't treat this like a real business. So, so you bring so you bring up the point of, of of what Jay Miller said. I was told by a GM that it really doesn't matter about percentage of filling up the the arena. As you know, I was I, wa- I was curious, like, to see how that was in comparison to, like, let's say, for example, like Milwaukee, like four thousand people as opposed to eight thousand full staff or full capacity, whatever, as opposed to, like, I was just curious, and I was told it's like, why why do you care? And I'm like, well, I just want to see how many more butts you can put mm. in the seats. Mm. Well, in, in I mean, Milwaukee I, with a full crowd, a full crowd of say six thousand, which is you know they hit six thousand twice last season, or or within you know a couple hundred, and ooh, loud in there, it's a huge, energetic environment. But when you look at that that ESPN camera view, you know the the field camera view, there's gaps of seats all over the place. And well, you got to understand though first. Any team who says they have 6,000 fans is not 6,000 butts in the seats. Well, I I don't care what any team says. Not one single team will report their drop count. Milwaukee actually actually does. No, they do not. There is – I will – explain to us what a drop count is? A drop count is basically what you get from the arena after the game. They basically – I typically would get mine at the end of halftime. They would text it to me or email me. That is what the number of scan tickets are for the game. And so even NFL, NBA team, like not a, not a team reports that number because it's always, it's always less. There, you know, if you sell 6,000 seats, you're never going to have 6,000 people there. There's always that percentage of people. And give you an example, because I know I get a lot of shit on it, uh, from you guys about you know saying I cook my numbers well I typically announce my numbers of tickets distributed okay unless it's a game where I paper the house and in in Lakeland I had to paper the house a lot I would never I shouldn't say never but I I would not typically announce my tickets distributed if I paper it's usually somewhere in between that and my drop count so in St. Louis, to give you an example, tickets distributed. So in our first year, we might have had 1,000 to 1,200 comp tickets per game, okay? Comp tickets, the way we operated, were sponsor tickets, uh, donations, you know, that kind of thing. So if you, if you bought a $100,000 sponsorship with our team, you might have 50 season tickets for the season or whatever, so that's how you get that. So a lot of times those free tickets, the redemption rate is much lower than a paid ticket. So the more comp tickets you have out, the less you're going to you know, see redeemed at the door. But I know that's your, your, your home team, man, but there's just, I don't see a single way. And I hate to throw them under the bus like that. He's there. Come on. I see Mike's in the thing. It's all about the revenue though. It's, and I agree, Mike and the, the, the team up there has done phenomenal with that. And that is always what I would post on Facebook when you guys would bash. It's like, hey, I don't care what the announced crowd is. We have to give something to the league. 
it's really about the dollars. And, you know, our first year we were one of the top, if not the top teams for revenue, but Mil, uh, but for some reason, Baltimore always had more fans. We were better than Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> No, but 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 it is true. I you 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 do read the numbers and then you're watching the streams and you're like, uh, it's also deceiving though too because if you're in a arena, let's just say like Milwaukee, would you say there's eight thousand seats? It's it's just shy of nine thousand, like eight thousand five hundred or so for soccer. Yeah. If all the seats are bunched up, it 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 will look different than if you know. There's tricks to making it look better than it does. And there's some games where we've had to do that in Lakeland where by spacing properly, it, it looks better. Um, and unfortunately, that's an optics thing. And that is really for us internally to help make sure that it doesn't look as bad as it is so that we can try to generate that revenue in, in partnerships and, and build that base as we're building. But Teams, teams don't announce drop counts. But they still do good promotions. It might not be as over the top. I mean, and even with the baseball, I follow, um, you know, the baseball team up there. And it's you, – you look and you see a lot of teams don't have those promotions going on. And with a short season like we have, I mean, you, you can't really afford to have bad games. You – you know, like baseball, you got, you know, in Major League 81 games at home, you know, you don't need every game to be a sellout. You need to have, you know, your handful of games that are great and then do okay. With us, you have to be – you can't afford that that night off, Yeah. you know, and that's yeah. – and, 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 and I think – I think every – and I, I, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say this. I think teams in the league need more fan interaction. They, they need more people right with, with a lot of passion. What, why? You took the words right out of my mouth because I was gonna bring up supporter groups. I was gonna bring up supporter groups. Yeah, like I, I think like every team in this league needs someone to like just call people and be like, hey. Listen, I, I, I'm calling on behalf of Utica City. Come to a game. I'll treat you to a game. What, what do you think? Like, I, I think the, the well, team is more do that? passionate. Why, why can't you staff. do that? Why can't I do that? Yeah. What's Ooh. stopping you? Ooh, the question. Take another okay. drink and then answer. <laughs> okay. So, so what I was going to say is, is I, I personally have been voluntold and slash I want to start a supporter group for the blast, right? To help mm-hmm. bring more people to the fan, to the stadium or the arena, sorry, and everything. But my thing is how much of a relationship can I really, you know, build with the front office? Cause for a supporter group to really do well, and for really dr- to draw in people for that. Because, you know, a supporter group is all about that experience, that game day experience. You know, if we can't if we can't sit there and sing or blow horns or, like, obviously we can't wave flags because we're not outdoors. But, <laughs> you know, they're so limited on what we can do. It's really hard to build that supporter group. You know well, I mean? Gio, I know the, you, you I know the, the GM for the Blast. You got to have the teams buy into it, but you know how do you how do you? I know different cities have different um, audience makeup. The wave is like a lot of soccer families, and you know the parents, they, the mothers want to go there and talk to each other and watch their kids just devour all the food, and and the kids want to just you know be there and run around and watch soccer and things like that. And it was it was more of a distraction, I think. So I don't remember which owner, if it was if it was Zimmerman or if it was before Zimmerman they just kind of ax, axed that whole thing. I, I, actually, I heard a rumor that they took away their free – it might have been Zimmerman because he took away the free tickets, and they're like, fine, we're not going to do it anymore. He's like, okay. And then <laughs> they just – we haven't lost them at all. But the way yeah, they Yeah, no, and it's – I mean, it, it's, it's when, good. Uh, when the Chicago Mustangs used to come up, when they were in the league, for a couple seasons they would bring drums, and they would all sit in, like, the same corner section. It was actually kind of a cool rivalry, 
And people must have complained about that because at one point, only for Mustangs games, they had all these signs outside that said no drums allowed. <laughs> so it was no other team had that restriction just for Mustangs games. Um, but I think it's I think with the way the atmosphere is, and I'm talking Milwaukee specifically, the the so Van, you've seen, you know, obviously we talked about Van. You've seen the way he runs a crowd. Um, he's one of the best people I've ever seen control a crowd and 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 bring the energy out of a crowd at the right time because it's the whole crowd is the supporter group at that point and the music and everything. It's not just, you know, it's the the chance, the let's go wave chance, the defense, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I think that might, I think it's hard to play that into a supporter group like that because, you know, you can't get the long chance going and things like that. You can in Utica, but I think Milwaukee specifically, I, 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 it works. I mean, obviously it works. Yeah. But. I mean, it's definitely harder than, you know, if it was outdoor or something else. I mean, yeah. I think to really do it, you have to have that relationship with the front office so that you can be like, okay, let's sit in a game day meeting and let's talk about, okay, well, look, we're going to designate four times for you to do, you know, these, these long chants and uh, these four times we want you to get the crowd going with a beat, you know, with clapping. But I mean, I think it just starts with kind of building that relationship with the club and hopefully clubs are open to it. I mean, I know I was always open to trying to do whatever we could to get fans in there and, and engage with them, get them to help. But I see Aaron had posted something on there about sponsorships. What do you guys think the average sponsorship dollar amount is for a team? No. Like, per, like per deal. I mean, I say like 30 to 20,000, to be honest. That's what I was, I was thinking 25. Yeah. I know that, that in the, in the, the person we talked about earlier from, from St. Louis who watches old time games a lot. Um, when when he had his little rift and a couple of his friends left with him, uh, one of them says that he is was pulling his sponsorship money of fifteen thousand a year, and that that was basically you know keeping the team afloat. So I don't believe a lot of that, but I believe the amount. So I, I would say so fifteen was Stang, well, that was Stangy Law Firm, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, he told me the same thing um, that he, that he was out. That is probably a bigger deal. Wow. To be honest. So, so to give you an idea, I mean, one of the biggest deals in the league back my first year was um, I had two $75,000 deals. Uh, and then they had some other, you know, throw in marketing money and stuff, but um, they were two of the largest deals in the entire league. The average deal for us in St. Louis was probably about 10,000. Wow. wow. So, you know, Every team is a little different, but just I was curious to see what you guys kind of thought just to kind of, you know, get an idea. I mean, some teams are selling dasher boards for 2,500 to 5,000. I'd say that's probably the average dasher board if you just want a dasher board ad. Sure. sure. Now, again, Milwaukee may be different. Um, they're, they're on the high end, um, you know, high level of everything, but some of these other teams I know are in that range. Um, you know, we would have some twenty-five thousand dollar deals, but not a ton of them. In St. Louis, we had a lot of ten thousand, and that kind of includes, you know, some sponsorship tickets, a little bit of everything. Um, but so you think about that, okay? So let's just say ten thousand is the average, and it's probably not the average for the bottom half of the teams. Bottom half of the teams is probably five thousand. Wow. Um, so, how many of those do you need, you know, to support the team? And then, so everyone always asks, how many fans do you need to break even? And it's kind of an incomplete question because you got to know how much other revenue you have because ticket revenue is only, you know, a portion. Right. So in our first year in St. Louis, we, like I said, we did over 40,000 a game in tickets. So we did almost 500,000 because that year we played 12 games. Um, we had uh, a couple non-league games. Okay, so we did almost five hundred thousand, and then um, I think it was around four hundred thousand in partnerships, and then um, merch, tryouts, everything else, another fifty to a hundred thousand. So that's kind of to operate a team, um, and that's way more than what they're getting now. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's probably half that now in St. Louis and in you know some of these other markets that 
you, you know, like Florida, Harrisburg, whatever. I mean, Dallas, even um, those teams. So it's, it's a very fine line to, to be able to make money. Everybody get up, everybody get up, everybody get down. Everybody get up, everybody get up, everybody get up, everybody get down. Everybody dance to the rhythm. We're gonna ride to the rhythm. Everybody dance to the rhythm. Everybody get up, everybody get up.